All right, that's cool. All right, cool. So, hey guys, thanks so much for coming by the uh, paperclip. As usual, um, this is a paperclip we run out of Asia, where we go through one paper every week. Uh, so today we're just um, recording it for the first time, and uh, we hope that you'll benefit from it. So as usual, if you guys got any questions, you can either like let me know, and I can invite you guys to the stage. Uh, you can drop it in the chat, uh, which you can access by just clicking the button on the top, uh, just the little like message icon. And yeah, do you want to take it away, Brian? Sure. Thanks, Ivan. <laughs> so um, today, we'll be going through um, the comprehensive overview of large language models. Uh, but on top of that, I think what we want to do also is just to share you know, the reason why um, attention actually came about uh, before the Transformers paper. So we'll have a little bit of um, a history lesson on that, on why it was developed. And then we will go through um, the paper talking about what has happened um, post the Transformers era. Uh, in fact, it's when the GPT era started. So I'm going to begin. Um, as you can see, the link um, has two parts. So I'll use the first part to talk about pre, I would say GPT, and then I'll use the second link to talk about the paper prop. So um, let's begin. So essentially what models have been trying to do recently is this idea of language modeling, where given a previous sequence of words, which is your input or your prompt, you want to find out the next word in the prompt. Right? In this case, it can be question and answers. So uh, it can be modeled essentially by this probability of the next token given the sequence of tokens. So that's when you can see uh, the next token, which is t plus 1, over um, the, given the sequence over here up to t, uh, time it goes to t, position it goes to t. And of course, your t plus 1 is a sample uh, a sample from the vocabulary that you have, which is basically your subwords or the tokens that you have. Okay. So um, why is this the case? I think for us uh, who are doing NLP, beyond just thinking about looking at what the sequence is, what, what, what's being generated in the sequence, we, it's good to think about what kind of use case or what kind of task we're doing. And I'll say this is very useful when it comes to thinking about the uh, evaluation metrics for each of these evaluation tasks. Uh, so you can be things like this. Your screen just kind of like cut out for me. Is it? Okay, is let it? me oh, see. Oh wait, sorry, no, no, uh, sorry. Okay, it works again, so my bad. It just, I need to disappear oh. from yeah. It works Okay. Again, my bad. yeah. No problem. So um, things like machine translation that we'll be talking about, um, we've got question and answer, summarization, so on and so forth. So essentially, um, good to think about what task uh, we are trying to attack uh, when we are using the different models. Right? So while we think about language models as uh, predicting the next token, it's also useful to think from a linguistic perspective um, what is being learned by these models. So um, there's a list over here. Uh, I'll just go through a few that is useful. Um, things like facts, which is trivia. So these are the ones where you know you can say um, the penalty for getting the prediction wrong is relatively higher because if you have uh, if you output something that's false, then uh, your language model is probably not truthful. Um, things like um, sentiment, which we have uh, seen before, things like reasoning. So in this case, if you look at the sentence, uh, Iro went to the kitchen to make some tea. Standing next to Iro, Zuko pondered his destiny. Zuko left the... So in this case, the idea is that um, there is some sort of spatial um, understanding. Uh, uh, the model needs to understand some spatial understanding of the sentence. In this case, um, Zuko is currently in the kitchen, so he left the kitchen. Right. So these are some of the things um, that from a synthetic perspective or from a linguistic perspective, we observe uh, models are learning in terms of patterns. Right. So from uh, language models, we talk about conditional language models. So essentially, the idea is that we are trying to um, generate a target sequence in a target sentence given some sequence in the source sentence. So that is why uh, you see over here that we are not just generating our YT, 
given some y1 to yt minus 1, which is basically the um, sequence that has been generated by the model before, but also we want to condition it on the source sentence. Right? So that is essentially what translation does. You give, if you think about it, you give um, the model a source sentence, you pick the target uh, language, and then you observe the model generate the sequence in the target language. Right, so it's more than just language modeling, but it's also conditional. Right? And one of the key things that we will notice in language, uh, conditional language modeling is that we don't necessarily see um, that the first word in the source sentence corresponds to the first word in the target sentence. So as you can see, this might be it, uh, first word to first word, but just the second word onwards, you start to see that there is this sort of uh, crisscross uh, relationship where you might need to, uh, where maybe the second word over here corresponds to the third word and the third word over here corresponds to the second. So essentially the idea is that uh, we want to find a way to be able to model this relationship. And um, this relationship has actually been studied before in this idea of alignment where if you think about it, if let's say we've got the clause sentence, let's say um, on the top and the target sentence on the bottom or on the, on the left, then if we've got this very linear one-to-one -one relationship uh, or this monotonic relationship, then we will see that there is these, there will be a white box over here from the top left to the bottom right, indicating that the first word corresponds to the first word, second word corresponds to the second word, so on and so forth. But as you can see, just from English to French, um, there is this idea where words um, that is uh, later in the sequence corresponds to words that's earlier and vice versa. So that is how we can um, visualize attention. Right? So then the question is, okay, what, how are we, um, in a sense, modeling it, or what does it look like from the encoder-decoder perspective? So naturally, when we look at the encoder-decoder blocks, um, this can be, um, a, let's, look, let's look at this as an RNN. Right? We say that the hidden state, uh, the last hidden state in the encoder block um, contains all the information of the entire sentence. But there's this information bottleneck problem, which means that if let's say this is a longer sentence, the last hidden state might not contain information of the earlier tokens. And therefore, there's this idea of attention where you have, given that you've got all the hidden states of all the input tokens, the decoder, when during the, during the language generation uh, component, will pay attention or attend to uh, weighted sum of all the hidden states. So if let's say I've got something that is uh, later in my sequence um, that corresponds to a token that is earlier in my store sentence, then I will see uh, the attention weights giving more weight to the uh, hidden states in the source sentence. So essentially that's the idea um, of attention that has been implemented in the um, encoder decoder kind of paradigm or the kind of architecture. So the problem with that is that when we uh, create these or we calculate these individual hidden states, we realize that it has to be calculated sequentially. That means in this diagram, you can see that the second hidden state has to only, can only be calculated after the first hidden state is being output. And the third hidden state can only be calculated after the second hidden state has been output. So the question is, um, can we remove or break free from this idea where there is a dependency of the previous state? Because if we're able to do so, then we are able to run our forward pass and collect our gradients and run back prop on the architecture uh, con uh, con concurrently across the whole sequence. Right. So essentially, that's the uh, idea of your key query value attention. Uh, and that 
essentially forms um, one of the building blocks uh, of the transformer architecture. Right? So um, I think from here, what we're just going to talk about is um, there are other components to the transformer architecture beyond just our uh, key query value attention. Um, there is also this idea of understanding um, the position of the text and that's basically an idea of adding position representations that you will see in the paper later. Um, adding some sort of nonlinearity uh, when you're doing the calculation and that's essentially just adding a feed forward layer uh, on top of it. So the idea is that if you're just calculating key query value pairs, you're always looking at linear uh, combinations uh, of your, you can see your values because you're just um, getting a weighted sum of the values calculated by attention. So we want to add a, a layer of non-linearity to it, which is uh, taken care of by the feed forward network. And of course, the last part is uh, when you're doing the decoding step, when you're generating the tokens, um, you want to not let the model see the future tokens. And essentially that's when masking comes into play. Uh, attention masking comes into play. So you will start to see that uh, in the decoder architecture um, later down the road. Okay. So a couple of things uh, on top of what we are talking about in terms of the, uh, the language modeling component for transformers. Um, one topic is subword model. So this is when you have things like uh, tokenization, uh, your byte pair encoding. So essentially, what are we trying to solve over here? If you look at this um, table at the bottom, we start to see that for words that exist outside the vocabulary, that can be things like a variation of an existing word. In this case, you add many a's in between um, the word t uh, between t and a for tasty to probably indicate that it's very tasty, or misspellings of words, which is also very common in input, or novel words over here where we understand the word transformerify might mean um, adding maybe a transformer uh, block into an existing architecture, but it's a word that we might not see in the existing dictionary. So for them, for these words over here, if you just use a traditional vocabulary or a dictionary vocabulary, the index will be some sort of an unc token. Okay. Um, and essentially what goes on with uh, byte pair encoding is that it starts to learn these shorter um, combinations of letters that can sometimes um, represent either prefixes or suffixes of a word. Um, and then essentially you are able to generate the embeddings for them. So if you see over here, you've got this TAA um, and then anything after that and AAA and anything after that and STY. So this guy probably you've seen it in other uh, existing words. Um, and therefore there is an existing embedding that's associated with it. And therefore we are able to represent it over here. You can think of it maybe as a, you're essentially creating, you're essentially generating three tokens from this. Uh, source sequence over here. Okay. So essentially, that's the idea of um, subword models, or in this case, you've got things like uh, byte pair encoding, sentence piece, word piece, and things like that. Essentially, that's the problem that they're trying to solve. Okay. So um, three types of uh, architectures. Um, the key thing over here to note is that what we have in the transformer block is essentially replacing uh, the recurrent neural network blocks that we had previously. So when we talk about recurrent neural networks, of course, we add things like LSTMs, GRUs, bidirectional models, multi-layer models. So it encompasses all that. And essentially what we have over here are the three types of archi dominant architectures. Uh, we've got the encoder models, and examples of this will be things like BERT, where you learn via mass language modeling, which has been covered before. Um, encoder decoder models, where we've seen earlier, we have an encoder um, that maps your sequence into um, a space or a position in latent space. And then from there, you perform your um, sampling or your autoregressive sampling of tokens to form your target sequence, which is what we've seen in T5. And the decoder models, which I think all of us are familiar with, things like GPT-2, GP3, 3, they are all there. So you essentially learn um, the language of patterns and then you directly just um, do your uh, autoregressive uh, sampling or decoding from there. Okay. 
So from there, right, we will lead to this paper that we have over here, which is the comprehensive overview of large language models. If you take a look at this paper, um, it seemed to me that there were multiple updates to the paper. And that sig signals to me that there's probably going to be updates along the way. So I think what's useful is beyond looking at just the paper itself, um, understand, or for me, what I did was I tried to understand what was the framework that the authors were using to attack um, understanding of um, the knowledge, um, then dividing it and then giving us a, a, a reader to understand it. Right? Um, it's a very dense paper. Um, it's got, I think, over 450 citations. So um, I think it's more of a pick your own adventure, pick your own journey, pick your own um, learning process uh, kind of, I would say, direction um, so that along the way you'll be able to build the foundation knowledge and then uh, add layers on it, add layers on it. The idea of the day, we all know that new models are always developed and new models are always announced. Um, so going back to the first principles and fundamentals are useful. So um, let's just go through the paper very quickly. Um, let's just start from the top over here. So essentially, we'll just talk about the last point over here where we are seeing that large language models, uh, in particular things like GPT-3, are able to perform your downstream tasks without specific fine tuning. So that's the first key point, because if we looked at T5, um, we saw that the performance of T5 on downstream tasks, in this case, it can be translation, it can be your glue task, it can be your squat task. Um, their performance only will get better once you fine tune on that particular task. Right? And you've seen there, there are multiple experiments where they've done, um, which demonstrates that that's the better way, that's the better alternative. So um, what GPT-3 demonstrated was that they are able to perform zero-shot transfer learning on these tasks. So what does that mean? That means that if you just give the prompt uh, from the downstream task, GPT-3 is able to give the answer. So that kind of changed things where we actually might not need to fine-tune for a particular task. Of course, when we look later down the road, we see that there's uh, very, very specific ways of doing things like instruction tuning. Right? But that was one of the big discoveries that they had back then. On top of it, um, they were able to show things like reasoning, they were able to show things like planning, they were able to show things like in-context learning. So we, we get to see them, uh, examples of this later when you do things like uh, chain of thought prompting. Right? So they're able to understand, you know, like given certain patterns, um, when they ask for the next, when they ask for um, a question that, or ask for a task that follows a similar pattern from the prompt, they are able to answer. Um, the problem that we see today is that um, the cost of training them or pre-training them is relatively high, usually in the tens of millions. Um, so the question is that can we get better at pre-training these models? Um, can we look at things like better architectures? Can we look at things like uh, more uh, efficient ways of um, fine-tuning our parameters? Uh, are there ways that we can represent these vectors in a lower uh, vector state or, or, a low, or a state that, is, that uses less um, granularity, right? So that's essentially what things like architectures come into play, uh, quantization comes into play. So um, the way I, div I saw this paper was that we had the background, which talks about some of the key concepts, um, and then the different types of LLMs and their particular use cases. Uh, the data sets that have been used to train them, at least the public ones. What kind of evaluation tasks are they looking at? So probably that's what we call evals. Um, and the different types of applications uh, for these LLMs in the commercial world. And of course, um, from there we talk about you know, what uh, probably researchers are looking at um, going into maybe say the next three months or the next year. So. Let's look at some of the fundamentals. So I'm going to start from the left side. Um, 
the paper is covered. We have covered some of these topics from the paper. Tokenization, um, attention mechanisms, um, the different types of activation functions. So those are stuff that we've learned. Uh, you can get a recap when you do your traditional uh, deep learning um, topics. Then, of course, we talked about the different types of architectures, which was covered earlier. Your encoder only, your encoder decoder, your decoder only. And naturally, each of them will have their own associated way of doing attention masking. So that's this part over here. Um, we talked about the different types of pre-training objectives. Naturally, things like mass language modeling are things that we see in um, your encoder-only models. Uh, language modeling are things that we see in your encoder-decoder models. So mass language modeling, basically, in this diagram, is uh, you, feed, you give the model this token and these tokens over here, and the model is expected to predict these targets over here, the ones that have been highlighted. Whereas in full language modeling, so essentially it's like a fill in the blank kind of problem. Whereas for full language modeling, you give the first token and then the model is expected to predict the second, third, fourth, fifth token, so on and so forth. So that's that. There have been also um, research into this thing called prefix language modeling, where you feed the model um, one part of the sequence and then you're asking the model to um, generate the remaining uh, parts of the sequence. And what's useful over here is that when they do prefix language modeling, they use this thing called um, a, causal mask with, a causal mask with prefix, which means that the, for the input tokens, the model is able to see or attend to all the previous tokens in the input before it starts to generate output. And that's why when you see, uh, as the model generates the output, you still, you still have that um, element of mass attention. So essentially that's this part over here. Um, things that are, I would say, if you look at the transformer paper, which is, which is covered over there, will be things like um, layer normalization, where you, um, div where you divide the weights by the mean, Sorry, sorry, you minus the mean from the weights and you divide it by the, as the standard deviation of the weights. And essentially what we're doing is that we're trying to achieve uh, numerical stability uh, of the weights, right? So that as when, you, when you do a forward pass and you do, and you do your back propagation, you don't have numbers that go uh, all over the place. So that's uh, layer normalization. Um, positional encoding was something we talked about earlier. Um, in the original paper, they had this idea of sinusoidal position representations. So how to read this uh, graph? Okay, so essentially how to read this graph is that as you go from left to right in the, uh, as the index of the sequence increases, essentially you are applying some sort of uh, sinusoidal function on top of it, such that every uh, token in the sequence as a positional representation. It's augmented by a positional recommendation. So essentially from left to right, all these vectors actually look different, right? Um, but what happens is that uh, this way of encoding position representations um, is not learnable because there is no such way to do, um, it's no such way to have a gradient and then to um, update the positions. So therefore, uh, it has been changed to something as simple as just adding um, a position representation on top of the uh, embeddings. And of course, if you look at the paper, there are also newer ways to do it. Things like alibi, things like um, rope. So that's the left-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side over here, we are looking at newer ways or uh, ways that can help with training or implementation. So things like uh, the libraries that we're using, uh, JAX, PyTorch, TensorFlow, amongst others, um, there's this idea of distributed training, which means that um, can we use multiple GPUs to train uh, our models so that we are able to learn the weights faster. So amongst others, there's this idea of data parallelism where you duplicate your model in two GPUs. So let's say I've got two GPUs. I duplicate my model in both GPUs and then I run separate batches on top of them. So let's say if I've got a batch of, I don't know, 100,000, right? I split it into 50,000, 50,000. I run the first batch of 50,000 in, in, in the first model in the first GPU. 
And then the other 50,000 in the same model in the second GPU, calculate the gradients, average them, and then perform my back. Right, so that's what data parallelism is. Um, tensor parallelism, essentially the idea is that um, you calculate the uh, matrix multiplication steps uh, in multiple GPUs, and then you add them up. So what happens is that, as you can see, uh, we know that for each row, um, the calculation, the multiplication with a column can be done concurrently, and therefore it splits it up such that the first that this uh, the the matrix on the left multiplies with only one column, matrix on the right multiplies on the second column, and then you combine them together, or in this case, you concatenate the results together. So that again also helps us uh, with getting uh, the results from the forward pass a lot better. Okay, so that's that. Um, other kinds of tricks that we are using uh, are things like flash attention, where um, it's a very smart way of utilizing uh, memory. So what happens is that instead of calculating, instead of a series of steps that is very memory intensive when they load your, uh, your query, your key query matrix, let's do the calculation, perform the softmax and then get your results, um, they are doing some way or they are iterating it. Uh, and they are using very smart functions um, to calculate things like the uh, softmax of the fly. So essentially that's what they're doing over here. So it's an optimization of um, using your high bandwidth RAM and also the, the RAM in your, your GPU. Right? Because in your GPUs, you've got very fast computation but relatively lower memory. Okay? Um, just a little bit extra, this is one of those very common topics that they would like to um, start off as they go into things like your uh, Mamba models. So that's just the first part. So the second part in terms of um, the background will be how do we adapt these models for specific tasks. So um, there are things like transfer learning which we've seen before where we pre-train um, our T5 based model and then we fine tune on individual tasks. Um, there's also things like instruction fine tuning, where we are where the model is given a series of instructions and outputs, and then the model will, will fine tune uh, its outputs based on that. So examples of this can be things like if let's say I ask GPT to explain the moon landing to a six year old in a few sentences. Generally, in if the model is pre trained, there is this way where uh, GPT outputs the steps in this way. Right, so explain the, th the theory of gravity, explain the theory of relativity to a six-year-old, and then explain the Big Bang to a six-year-old, and then uh, explain the evolution to a six-year-old. So that's how GPT-3 will output its sentences. But if we are able to do some sort of instruction fine-tuning where um, there is some sort of emphasis on things like six-year-old in a few sentences, then um, this is the kind of outputs that you can get. And so that's the kind of uh, variations of different models that we can see when we download them uh, from open source um, say repositories, right? things like Hugging Face. Right? So that's instruction fine tuning over here. Um, and something called alignment tuning, where you want to ensure um, that your model uh, fulfills what people call the three H, the three H's of uh, model behavior. So your models will be harmless, your models will be honest, and your models are helpful. So things like harmlessness will be things like if let's say um, how can I, if let's say you ask the model how can I um, let's say bake a cake with cyanide in it, right? If let's say your model is not aligned alignment tuned, uh, the model might give the the instructions. But let's say if you do alignment fine tuning to tell the model, hey, this is something that you should not output or you you should um, you shouldn't give instructions for, then uh, the model will learn accordingly from that. So these are some of the methods that we want to fine tune our models with, such that our models are able to demonstrate a certain behavior. Then how are we doing it? We can use things, we can use skills like uh, reinforcement learning to do it, um, where essentially you, for each of the different outputs, you have a certain kind of reward. In this case, the reward is just a scalar value. Uh, and then you learn some sort, you, you learn some sort of uh, policy such that when the model outputs text based on this policy, 
uh, you get to maximize the reward. So the key thing over here is that uh, the policy has to be differentiable so that when you get some results from um, the model output and you get some reward, uh, sometimes your reward might not be good or you're comparing rewards, you're able to get the loss of the reward and back propagate it, back propagate it through the gradients to update the weights uh, in the policy. Right. So that's essentially what reinforcement learning is. Um, so in, typically for, I think when, when reinforcement learning was a hot thing back then, it was, it, it's, it's one course by itself. Right? So this is just a very high level um, five, six, uh, five minute uh, overview of it. On top of it, I think one of the things you are more familiar with is things like prompting. So we've got zero shot prompting where you just ask for tasks, uh, you, you just give a task and the model answers directly. Uh, but also you have things like chain of thought prompting where you give the, mod you give the model some examples before and then from there um, ask the model to mimic the behavior of the examples above. So that's essentially what you have over here. You've got uh, in-context learning of, I would say, translation on the, on the right and you've got uh, in-context learning of correcting uh, spelling mistakes on the left. So that is essentially um, this part over here and you get to see that a uh, few shots or things like uh, five shots or three shots usually have better performance against um, your zero shot or one shots. So that's this part over here. Um, and then the question of course is, you know, how do you craft um, this, uh, these prompts such that you'll be able to get the results that you want. So that's essentially um, the idea of what people like to call prompt engineering. Okay. So that's essentially the part of the backgrounds that we want to cover. Um, the next part over here, I would say, is uh, a very brief list of some of the models that we have. Now, the, keep in mind that um, a lot of these models, the, the, the list always is updated every two or three weeks. Um, so good to understand uh, so, so naturally, I think when the paper is going to be updated in the future, you will see ad additional models. Um, some of the high level, I would say, purposes that we see um, these models are trying to achieve can be things like your general purpose ones. So that's when you, you get your model to do all sorts of things. Um, there's also, of course, your multimodal ones, right? Where you, where you ask the model, where you give the model some uh, image then you maybe ask the model to um, decipher some fact or draw some conclusion from the image. Right? There's also, of course, your video-related ones. Um, there are some that are very specific to code generation. So here are some of them. Um, some that are very specific in the finance uh, domain. Some that are very specific in the science domain. Um, and of course, um, there are some that are very useful for chatbots. Right? So this is the list over here. Uh, there's a much more... Um, detailed list uh, in the paper itself. Um, having said that, of course, as, as, as mentioned, um, there are also additional papers um, that come out. Right? Uh, and so some of, there are also some, I would say, missing um, models, models that were not mentioned. Right? So these are some of them that have not mentioned. So good to understand that this is always an evolving um, list. Okay. Um, so what are some of the features that we see in these models? Uh, you've got things like your uh, instruction tuning, which was talked about earlier. Uh, we noticed that models are able to have uh, increasingly high context windows. Now the context windows are in the six figures, uh, sometimes even in the seven figures. Right? Um, there are also um, other ways in which LLMs can be used. Uh, I think a very popular one is RAC. Um, so there are, I would say, beyond just your general purpose use, you can always fine tune them for very specific purposes or purposes that uh, are very specific to maybe your own corpus or your own knowledge base. So that's essentially what we're doing over here. Uh, other topics for the reader explore. So essentially what we're doing over here is uh, we're talking about ways, actually most of these topics over here, if you look at them, are about parameter efficient fine tuning. So things like quantization, 
uh, where let's say instead of representing a number in 32 bit I represent my number in 8 bit or 4 bit and see if I can uh, still maintain the model accuracy generally the model accuracy will go down uh, but the thing is if you're able to get lighter models smaller models uh, that's actually very useful uh, multimodal LLMs that we talked about earlier that take in things like uh, images and video as inputs um, adapter tuning essentially is when you just add another layer on top of the output and then you perform fine tuning on it um, there are more sophisticated ways to use it where your adapter is used in, in two or more um, models that means the same adapter is being used in let's say a general model and also let's say a uh, GPT model um, I've seen that in the uh, talk about embedding uh, representation learning uh, mixture of experts uh, something that we've seen before so where instead of just um, having one feed forward uh, layer over here you are actually able to rock them to different uh, feed forward uh, layers and then from there uh, you'll be able to in a sense uh, then once you multiply them together so you you'll be able to leverage on different uh, I would say different vertical workflows of the model where each of the ver uh, vertical workflows will learn uh, different aspects right? so that's essentially your MOE uh, low rank adaptation or LoRa um, this looks very popular recently so essentially what we're trying to do is if you are able to reduce the number of uh, parameters during your gradient updates then you actually use less compute to get your uh, fine-tuned models and the idea behind it is that instead of so let's say over here instead of um, calculating gradients for 64 parameters for an 8 by 8 matrix what you can do is that if you can decompose this matrix into a uh, 8 by 2 and a 2 by 8 matrix the key thing over here is that when you multiply this by this, you get back uh, the 64, you get back 64 weights, or the resultant is, uh, is an 8 by 8 matrix, which is 64 weights. If you're able to decompose it uh, with weights in a smaller dimension, essentially this idea is that, and of course the, how small it is, is uh, a hyperparameter for you to tune, then the cost of uh, fine tuning uh, will go down. Okay, so essentially that's what we're doing over here. Yeah. So, that's pretty much it for this segment um the last the next few segments uh this next segment essentially is about your data sets that can be used for training at least the public ones that we see uh we've got a, these are things that we've seen before wikipedia data set c4 data set common crawl uh which is used for your i would say more general purpose models um and then of course you've got some um data sets that can be used for very task specific uh, models for example code generation you've got um, data sets that is used for instruct fi uh, instruction fine tuning and you've also got data sets that's used for alignment so um, essentially what happens is that if you go to maybe say um, tensor data set tensorflow data sets or hugging face you'll be able to download them um, and then you'll be able to observe um, these data sets uh, by itself and if let's say you want to maybe say um, fine-tune a model for specific use uh, these are actually useful I would say templates or schemas that you can use uh, to prepare your data sets so that you can do fine-tuning um, so this is instruction tuned um, and this is for um, getting the model to be more to, to, to have to display uh, behavior that's more aligned to uh, our use so naturally this one I'm okay to share um, some examples but this one you can go ahead and click on the link you'll be able to see the kind of examples um, that's over there so let's say we've done our training or fine tuning we find we found a way to um, get our to, to, to update our parameters in a more efficient way the final part uh, is of course evaluation so um, I think we'll cover uh, at a high level um, two classes of uh, model evaluations You've got things like your single task evaluations. So very popular ones will be things like squat, uh, story close, math, uh, MNLI, uh, which is for question answering, uh, understanding context of words where you're filling in the blanks, um, answering questions, answering math questions, uh, so mathematical reasoning, 
um, and this is, I believe, uh, natural language inference. So essentially, whether your whether the two sentences are uh, they they follow each other or not, right? Essentially, whether uh, the next sentence logically follows the first sentence or not. Um, and also things like truthful QA, which validates whether a sentence, uh, whether the model outputs facts uh, instead of maybe just say other kinds of um, maybe trivia that's not true, not truthful. So these are some of, I would say, your uh, single task uh, evals. And then you've got your multitask evaluation, things like glue, things like MMLU, um, things like super glue, and of course there are a couple more that's inside um, the list. So what happens over here is that if we just take look, just take a look at glue, um, there are this is divided into multiple uh, e multiple individual evaluations. So you've got things like uh, natural language inference. You've got things like um, whether a sentence uh, makes sense or not. So that's your cola. You've got things like semantic similarity. So essentially, that's what's going on over here. Uh, MMLU, which is one of the more popular ways of uh, doing benchmarks right now. Um, so there's a big number of uh, knowledge intensity tasks that you can see over here. Um, and of course, Super Glue, which is the second generation from Glue, which has uh, more, I would say, I would say questions that mimic um, human behavior more, or things that are a bit trickier for models to understand. Okay. So um, that is the part on evaluations. Uh, so different kinds of applications, I think we've seen many kinds. So beyond just things like uh, what's in the list, uh, we also see things like music generation, we see things like uh, video generation. And naturally what happens is that for each of them, um, there are also certain guardrails that need to be in place. So what are some examples? If let's say for a uh, music generation uh, model, uh, it is important to ensure that when we submit lyrics for uh, the model to output, um, these lyrics should, shouldn't should be under any co copyright. If not, then there might be legal consequences. Right? So um, this is something that uh, I would say, depending on the domain that you're in, um, you will be looking at models that are very specific to your domain. So finally, Last part, before we go into Q&A, um, what are some of the things that we see models exhibit? So things like biases are very common, stereotypes are very common. Uh, and I guess the reason why is, is based on some of the training data that we see. If the training data exhibits a certain behavior, naturally we see the model um, exhibit, exhibiting this behavior. So, so that's I think one of the things that we want to be aware of. Um, and also things like, uh, models um, memorizing private content. So if let's say I've got a GPT model and I, I tap in a particular prompt uh, and this GPT model sees some email and then it outputs some sort of phone number that is supposed to be private. Uh, and let's say a user takes this and does a search on. So essentially the idea is that this is the output from the model and you can see there's actually some information over here that might be, that might be private. You might have a phone number that's not supposed to be um, exposed to the public. Um, and then maybe someone searches for the phone number and there you might have an additional contact uh, that maybe you can use, right? So um, these are some of the things that we want to, I would say, be aware of um, when it comes to uh, the component about human alignment. So on top of the three H's, help, making helpful, being harmless and being honest. Uh, you also want to ensure that your models um, do not have, do not, do not leak out or do not learn certain private information. Um, and generally, what happens is that there is uh, teams like there are, there are teams that are behind uh, all these ways of conducting adversarial attacks. You can call them white hat attacks or what people like to call uh, red teaming these models. So essentially, trying to generate adversarial um, prompts or find ways such that the model will leak out something. Um, and then if they're able to do so, they will fix it. Okay, I think there's a few um, interesting articles about that recently. So essentially, uh, that is the paper. Uh, it sounds like a fire hose of information. Uh, so 
if there's anything, any topic you want to deep dive into, feel free to um, take a look at the paper or take a look at this um, and go into the topics that you're looking at. So if let's say I want to just do something on parameter efficient tuning, feel free to just go into that segment. So um, I've linked all the papers uh, over here. I've also linked uh, some of the external sources that have been useful for me uh, over here. So uh, yeah, feel free to take this as a reference guide for yourself. Uh, and I think with that, I've come to the end uh, and I'm leaving about 10 more minutes if there's any Q&As. So, uh, Ivan? Uh, yeah, dude. Thanks so much for, thanks so much for giving the, such a detailed like, walkthrough. I think there was a question by Hong Nan in the chat about a parallelization of like what exactly is the benefit of using a transformer versus a, I guess in this case, a RNN RSTM. Do you want to maybe start with that? Like how the parallelization works. Mm, let me just take a look. Okay, so if you think about it, um, let's look at this example over here. One second, let me just... Okay, so the idea over here is um, if you think about the traditional RNNs, what happens is that, let's say I've got a sequence of 10 tokens. And I want to calculate the hidden state of the, the entire sequence, in this case, the sequence, the, the hidden state of the 10th token. There is a dependency um, of the ninth token, and the dependency of the ninth token is the, sorry, the ninth hidden state, and the dependency of the ninth hidden state, the hidden state, so on and so forth. And essentially, that's what's going on over here, where um, if let's say I want to calculate the second state, the second hidden state of the second token in the sequence, uh, I need to calculate the first. I need to calculate the first hidden state as an input. Um, so that goes uh, back to um, either your RNNs or LSTMs, where um, the hidden state is um, calculated. The, the the input to that hidden state is the hidden state of the previous uh, token, and also the input token. So the thing is that because there is this uh, dependency, um, there is this reliance on. Uh, the future hidden states rely on the, the previous hidden states and because of that, there is no ability to parallelize um, from a sequence perspective, on the war clock perspective. And therefore, you see the first line, back forward and back past first have O or sequence length. That means for how long the sequence length you have, um, you have to do that number of calculations. Does this make sense? I think it makes sense too. At least the way I like to think about it is that let's say I had five sentences and they're not the same length. In order for me to get the final hidden state, before I can start evaluating its predictions, I need to run like mm. five passes and for each character in each sequence, or each token in this case. While a transformer itself, I can just pad everything to the same length and pass it through in one time mm. step. So I can get everything out in like one, one like output step, one forward pass. At least that's my understanding right. of the parallelizableness of it. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree. Um, yeah. I would say for this... Um, di this diagram, we think of it during the training state. Naturally, during the inference stage, um, we still have to. There is still um, there is still this need of passing the hidden state of the current token back into um, the transformer, the the model to get the the next token. Yeah. For sure, for sure. I was thinking more about the training mm -hmm. stage too, but I think in terms of inference, exactly. you you incur the additional costs at the with the transformer with each additional token that R N N does. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately. Actually, for me, like one of the Correct. questions I had about the classification in this paper was that of prefix versus full language modeling. Because if you look at the example mm. that they give in the text, uh, I think they give the example of, you have this uh, cute, cute little example, which is, if it's full language modeling, they give the word may, and then you output the word the force be blue. If it's prefix yes. language modeling, it's may the force, and, the, and then the models ask to predict like be with you. But that mm. just both seems like, the same thing because my understanding of prefix mm. language modeling was that oh we're going to specify a specific token for example like uh like a bracket classify bracket like sentiment sort of like in t5 and the model learns that if it sees this specific like prefix then it should like sort of the it should perform differently and so that was why i was a bit confused by in this specific paper yeah. mm. no, that makes sense um i didn't look at the paper in particular, so it's a little bit hard to uh, comment on that. I understand when you are saying that, you know, this, this and this really doesn't show a lot of difference. Um, 
I think what I will, I think what I can comment is that um, generally in full language modeling, what happens is that you, uh, okay, this is this is of course the encoder decoder uh, phase of things uh, beyond the GPT stuff. So um, generally, what happens is that for full language, what hap uh, you you generate everything. So in fact, right, maybe in this case, uh, you might just start with a beginning of sentence token. And then you take maybe some hidden state and then you generate from there. And then you auto-regressively sample from there. Uh, which is different from the prefix language modeling where you are given a series of tokens, the, the beginning of sentence token, naturally, and then a series of tokens before you do your uh, generation. And then, of course, when you do your learning, you are learning based on that, that particular sequence uh, of text more than just the uh, beginning of sentence. I'm not very sure. I think we this one this one we've got to take a look at the paper to to fully understand. It was also the it was the guy who also was the author of the T five paper, I believe. Oh really? The guy who did this paper? Yes. Uh, I think his name is Colin. Yeah. yeah but let, let, let's go and check. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we can we can we can talk about this some other time. It was just I was just it was just something that confused me quite a good amount. I guess the other thing that surprised mm. me was just uh like learn positional encodings. Because I, when we covered mm. the original transformer paper, I think there was a section where they said, "Oh, we experimented with learn and frozen positional encodings." But it seems like you know, like you mentioned, that newer papers are starting to use learn positional encodings instead, and it's shown like an increase in performance. And I was wondering if maybe like you know, what sort of change, in your opinion, to make this happen, if that makes sense. Hmm. To be very honest, uh, it's I'm not very sure what um what were the changes that inspired it. Um, maybe the way I would comment is that you know once they are able to do so, um, they are able to represent, they are able to efficiently represent um an input with a much longer context window. So I think there were, probably what happened was that there was uh, innovation in that space. Because the thing is that if let's say I've got maybe say 500 tokens or 1000 tokens, um, there might be a limitation on how you, um, you, 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 you uh, model, the, the model the positions because maybe the positions might all be just clustered in one area. But I think once they have figured out how to do so, that's when they open up the window to longer context windows. So maybe how they, how they learn uh, how they learn uh, position encodings might be one of the tricks that they use to 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 have uh, longer context windows. But again, I might be wrong. Uh, didn't really go into the details of this uh, uh, part of research. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I was just wondering about mm. because that was just something that uh, I was intrigued by. Yeah, uh, I think we're mm. almost at time. And if anyone has any other questions, you can drop in the chat. Uh, if not, maybe we can just end it here. Uh, anyway. Okay, um, it seems like there's no more questions. Uh, so anyway, I think moving on to next week's paper, uh, I was thinking of doing a deep seek MOE paper. I, that was one thing I'd like to present, to propose, sorry. Because uh, it, I, I thought it's super interesting, and uh, there are a whole bunch of these ideas that they're, that they're experimenting with, like always on experts, randomly routing, ex randomly routed experts. So I thought it's a good paper. Um, so as usual, if, if if anyone wants to present on the paper itself for the upcoming week, then um, you know, happy to help you with it. I think you, you generally learn a lot more when you when you actually do the paper. I learn like at least like ten times more if I if I actually had to sit down and present the paper. So um I think as usual I'll probably just drop um like a thread inside the paper paper club. And then uh, if you guys have any other papers that you'd like to suggest, you can add it on to the thread and then we can all vote for that. Yeah. Do you have any papers in mind, Brian? Anyone has any other papers that you guys want to read? Mm, I'll take a look. I'll take a look at them. There are some. There are some. I would say, um, uh, very open source models. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how. Maybe one day next month, I can take a look at them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. No problem. Sounds good to me. Mm. Yeah. Then otherwise, uh, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in today's uh, session. Mm. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, looking forward to next week, guys. Ciao. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Bye-bye. Have a good evening.